I am most happy here this morning to be with you. Even though our orphanage is in England, uh, I was born in Kropenstadt, the country of Prussia, in the year 1805. There are perhaps only one or two of you who were born that same year. Looking to see if Head Dr. Ross is here this morning. Danke, there you are. In my lifetime, I have had over 50,000 answers to prayer. And you are saying to yourself, that is a very large number. How do you know such a number as this? Because I write them down. See, we are like the children of Israel. We forget what God has done for us. We forget that God has brought us through the wilderness. Yeah? We forget that God has met our needs. We forget that God has answered the prayers in our lives. And we worry today because we forget what God has done in the past. You have been studying the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 tells us, Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is. That He is. That He is Yahweh Shammah, the God who is there. Yahweh Yireh, the Lord who provides. Yahweh Rophe, the God who heals. That he is. That he is a reward of those who diligently seek him. Perhaps you are saying to yourself, God has answered your prayers because, uh, because you are so old. Yeah. Sometimes I think we believe that God answers the prayers of older people, not younger people. Or perhaps you are saying to yourself, God answers your prayers because you are a pastor or because you are a good man. No. God does not answer prayer because we are good. How good would you have to be? No, God answers prayer because He is good. For some things I have prayed for a moment and God has answered. For some things I have prayed uh, for an hour. For some things a day, a week, a month, a year, five years, ten years. For one thing I have prayed faithfully every day for 40 years for God to answer. And I believe that one day God shall answer this prayer. I'm going to share some things with you in my life, and I do not share these things to lift up the sin. I certainly do not share these things to lift up George Muller. I share them to lift up the grace of God. When I was a very young boy of eight, nine, ten years of age, I was an extremely accomplished liar and thief. My father was a collector of taxes, and I would go into his study where he had the tax money. I would steal the tax money. Once my father laid a trap for me. He counted out an exact amount of money, and uh, then he'd go out. I go in. I take so much of the money, and uh, my father comes in. He counts. He knows exactly how much I have taken. He calls me into his study. George, you must, uh, you must reform yourself. Do not let me catch you stealing any longer. And so I became very careful not to be caught stealing any longer. I did not think it was wrong to do wrong. I thought it is only wrong to be caught doing wrong. Yeah. That is what we think sometimes. 10, 11, 12 years of age, I began to drink. I was uh, addicted to alcohol. 13, 14, I lived a very wicked life. I spent day after day in the drinking house, the gambling house, the places of wickedness. At 15, my father said to me, George, you are lazy. You are a liar. You do not like to work. I have found a perfect profession for you. You shall become a pastor. Then you'll have to work only one day a week. That is what people think sometimes. A pastor here has only to work one day a week. But I was going to be a pastor in the Lutheran church. In my country, Prussia, the Lutheran church, it is the state church. It is... Uh, uh, it is to have a government position if you were the pastor in the Durian church, uh, like uh, for you working for the post office. 
And so uh, it was uh, not a ministry, it was a job. But the Lutheran pastors, they make a lot of money. Frau Stober, perhaps you should tell your father about this. I am not certain. He would like to pass that along. And so I was going to be a wealthy pastor. I attended the university at Halle. I had many books on theology. I could translate Greek and Hebrew, Latin, but I did not read the scriptures. I was a very clever devil, as you say. I was championship debater. I was a first student, the highest uh, achievements at the university. But I lived my life drinking, gambling, living a wicked life. As a university student, even at the age of 16, I thought I should have a holiday. And so I, I forged a letter of permission from my father. I gave it to the provost at the university. I said, my father thinks I have been studying too hard. Uh, I need a holiday. And so I he gave him the letter. He gave me permission. I took all of my school books. I pawned them. I made the money with them. I went to the best hotels. I ate the best foods. I drank the best wines. I lived a high life. I invited all my friends to come to join me. When the money ran out, I go to another hotel. I run up large accounts again. The manager comes to me, young man, you must pay your account. I said, I cannot. I have no more money. I had to leave all of my clothing, which was upon my back, except that which is upon my back for payment. I went to another hotel. Again, I run up large accounts. The manager of this hotel comes to me, young man, you must pay your account. I said, I have no money. I have no clothing. I am 16 years of age. What can you do to me? He put me in jail. I felt at home. Finally, I had discovered people as wicked as myself. I was like it would say in the book of Proverbs. I was so evil, I could not sleep unless I had done some wickedness. My life was given to evil. My cellmate was a murderer. This was not a jail for children. I remember when I stepped in the cell, he said to me, I am a murderer. Watch out for me. I said, I have murdered three people. Watch out for me. He said, I have robbed two banks. I said, I have robbed five banks. I was not a bigger criminal. I was just a bigger liar than he was. But he became frightened of me. I was content to remain there. My father discovered my whereabouts. He sent money. He paid my debt. He delivered me from prison. He said, George, you must reform yourself. Who would wish to have a pastor as wicked as you? And so outwardly, I reformed myself. I became the model student but secretly still at night, drinking, gambling, living a wicked life. During my university days, I did meet one Christian studying for theology. His name was Bertha. And you are thinking to yourself, he wished to be your friend to tell you about Jesus Christ. No, he wished to be my friend so that I would take him along the wickedness I was doing. He was like so many Christians. He wished to walk as close to the world as he could walk. But the Holy Spirit dwelling within his heart will not allow him to enjoy his sin. And so he left my company. The next year I see him again. Better, better, how are you? Come, we will go to the drinking house. You can pay. No, I will not go with you to the drinking house. Where do you go? You appear to be going to a place. Where do you go? I'm, you do not wish to go with me. Oh, yes, you are my friend. We are good friends. I go with you. No, no, you do not wish to go with me. Where do you go? I'm going to a prayer meeting, he said. I would like to go with you to this prayer meeting, I said. You see, within my heart, I was so wicked. I thought, I will go to this prayer meeting, and with my much theological training, I will confuse and confound these people. I will make them doubt that the Scripture is the breathed Word of God. I will make them doubt Jesus Christ is born of the Virgin. I will make them doubt that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. I will seek to destroy their faith. That was the depth of my evil, my wickedness. And I said, again, I say you these things because I wish for you to understand. Perhaps today there is someone here, God has attacked your family. It is not going as you have planned. God has taken, uh, uh, Satan has taken your job. Satan has taken your health away. All of these things God has allowed to come in your life. And you say to yourself, why is this happening to me? I do not think we should ask God why. Satan brings these things into our lives sometimes to make us doubt, yeah? To destroy our faith, our belief in God. God allows these things to come into our lives 
to strengthen our faith, to build us up. But we ask Him why. Yeah? Our favorite question. I do not think we should ask God why. I think we should ask God what. Yeah? What is a better question. What God for me do you have to learn? So I go to this church to destroy their faith. This prayer meeting is in the house church. And I think to myself, I am much more learned than any of these people here. I have much more theological training. But I could not pray as these people pray. These people pray as if they are speaking to God. I had heard many prayers written out to please the ears of men. But these prayers that rose as a sweet smelling savor into the nostrils of God. When the meeting was complete, I go to the pastor. I said, could I return? I thought, I will argue with the pastor. I will destroy his faith. Then I will work on the others. And so the pastor said, young man, come as often as you like. And so the next night I come to argue, and the next night to argue, to argue, to argue. Every night I come back to argue. For two weeks I come to argue, and at the end of two weeks I had argued myself right into heaven. I became a believer in Jesus Christ. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. So, now, now I am a Christian. Now, I wish to be a pastor, but perhaps not in a state church. I wish to be a missionary pastor to the Hebrew people, the Jewish people in the country of Austria. I wrote to my father, Father, this is what I believe God would have me do. He said, I do not care what God will have you do. I did not send you away to become a poor missionary. I cut you off. No more money for you. Or before, I would lie, cheat, steal to get the money. I had done this many times when I had gambled away all of my school money. But I knew that such things were not honoring to God. I went to one of my professors, Dr. Toluk, a great theologian, a very godly man. I said, Dr. Toluk, what shall I do? He said, you must pray. He took me to the book of Matthew, chapter 7 and verse 7. It is a great and glorious promise spoken from Jesus Christ to those who follow him. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receive it. To him that seeketh, find it. To him that knocketh, it shall be opened. What man is there of you if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? If he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? But we do not ask, do we? We worry, yeah? And so I ask God to meet the need. Your country, America, it is a very special nation. God has used your country to send the gospel around the world to provide for many missionaries. Three pastors from your country, they come across the Atlantic Ocean, they come across the continent of Europe, they come to the University at Halle, they come there to study theology, and they did not speak any German. I speak German. I speak English. Perhaps you do not think I speak English so well, but uh, they came to me. They say, we understand that you speak English. Yes, I also speak Spanish. I also speak French. I also speak Russian. I also speak some of the Slavic languages and also some of the Scandinavian languages, Swedish, uh, Norwegian, uh, Danish. Uh, I also, oh, I must tell you, uh, the reason I learned to speak Swedish is that the Queen of Sweden asked me to come and share our ministry with her. And so I learned so I could share the gospel. And also Norway, the King of Norway asked me to come, so I have shared the gospel with him. Now I am in the process. I have been invited to go to China and Japan to share the gospel with the Emperor of China and the Emperor of Japan. So now I'm learning Japanese and Chinese. But at this particular time, I spoke only the seven languages. And so... They ask me, they say, you speak English? Yes. Would you translate the lectures for us in, into English? Yes. And also, would you take the notes for us? Yes. And, and also, would you help us to learn German so that we can do for ourselves? Yes. And also, we will pay you money. Yes. <laughs> and God paid me to go to school. I went through. I finished my training. I finished what you would call the graduate training. I was, going, I was going under the London Mission Society to Austria, and uh, they say, if you wish to go to Austria, you must come to England. And then, again, the question, why? Why should I go to England? Austria, it is only over the mountain. England, it is far away. But God wished for me to go to England. You see, God knows the end from the beginning. He knows our story completely. It is good to trust Him. We may ask God why, but He does not always say to us why, yeah? 
I go to England. I meet with the mission board, the London Mission Society. They say to me, we're going to give you a letter of credit. I said, what is a letter of credit? They say, it is a promise to pay. I said, God, he does not need the promise to pay. God pays. And so we part friends, but we part. And now I am an unemployed theologian in the country of England. I was invited to pastor a church, a very small church, just 50 people in Tainmouth, England, the southern coast of England, beautiful place, lovely place, just across from the Isle of Wight, perhaps you have been there. And so uh, there I am, and I preach it as a church of 50 people, and I preach faithfully the Word of God, and in three weeks, we didn't have 50 people no more. We had 30 people. I did not think it was supposed to go that direction. I thought you preach, they will come, yeah. And then the elders of the church, they come to me, they say to me, we're going to pay you 55 English pounds out of the pew rent. I said, what is pew rent? They say, we charge people to come to church. I'm looking at the empty seats here. You must be charging a lot of money for people to come here and sit in your church. They cannot afford. I think in America, you should charge people a lot of money to sit in the back of the church. Free seats in the front of the church. Yes. But I say, you cannot charge people to come to church. And they said, then you cannot, we cannot pay your salary. I said, we will trust God. They said, you are a very foolish young man. I spoke to one of the men in the church. He was a carpenter. I said, make a box. Put a hole in the top, a lock on the front. And I tell the church, whatever God will put upon your heart to put in the box, that will be my salary. I'm going to say some things about money. Money is not important to God. He paves the streets with gold. How important could it be? But He knows that it is important to us, and He frequently uses money to teach us about Himself, to trust in Him, to have faith in Him. I remember there were times I would not have any money. Once I needed one shilling for a new pair of boots. If Moses had been wearing my boots on a mountain, would not have to remove his boots to walk on holy ground. They were holy boots. Yeah. And I was praying for one shilling, and I look, I confess, I finished the sermon, and I'm peeking to see anybody put money in the box. I did not see anybody, anybody put money in the box. The elder who had the key, I did not have the key, I could not open the box. He opens the box. He said, Brother Mueller, there is nothing in the box. And my heart did sink just a little. He said, but one shilling. Should I give it to you now, or should I wait until there is more? Now is a good time. <laughs> and so God provides. But at the end of the first year, God, he had not provided 55 English pounds. God provided 155 English pounds. And most of this money I give away. The next year, God provided 185 English pounds. This also I give away. The next year, 210 English pounds. And this also mostly I give away. In my lifetime, I have given away what would be in your money here now today, approximately $30 million. God brings much money through my hands because, because it does not stick to my fingers. God allows me to support 169 missionaries completely. Do you understand this? Not just for a little each. No, all of them completely. God is good, yeah. And so God provides. The church did grow. It grew to several hundred. And uh, then God called me from this church to a smaller church in the city of Bristol, England. Tainworth, England, beautiful seaside, uh, lovely village, fishing village, Bristol, Engl uh, Brighton, uh, Bristol England, very uh, commercial, much uh, shipbuilding. And so I go, I take a small church, but then I, I preach at the second church. I pastor two churches. I preach at the one, and then I get on the horse. I ride to the next church. And so, uh, this is the work of God. But then God began to place upon my heart orphans. In England at this time, there was much industry, much change. Safety was not very high. Many people died. There was typhus, there was influenza, there was illness, people died. We estimate there were approximately... 250,000 orphans in England in this time, and not a single orphanage was there. 
When I had been a student, I had read how in the 1600s, a man by the name of Brother Frank operated an orphanage only by prayer. And for 200 years, this had been a testimony to the power of God. And I thought, I would like to leave a testimony for 200 years to the power of God. And so God placed upon my heart these orphans. It was so very hard for children. If a child was an orphan, they would keep them in jail. What do you think they learn in jail with the criminals? They learn to be criminals. If they did not uh, put them in jail, they would put them in the insane asylum as the crazy people. They could come and go, but there is where they were. They, they were in much danger. If a child wished to have a job, they, they might be a boy, might be the chimney sweep. Oh, you say, oh, chimney sweep, that is a good job. You put the brush up the chimney. No, they put the boy up the chimney. They would tie a rope around his middle so that when he suffocated and died in the chimney, they could pull his dead body out, and then they would throw it away in the street like so much rubbish. Children were forced into prostitution, into the opium trade. They might be forced to pull a coal cart in the darkness until they went blind because there was no light. It was a very hard time for children. And so we began to pray that God would open the door for us to have an orphanage. I did not tell anyone, only God. This is, uh, it is uh, the way that uh, it is our policy. If you come to me and you say, do you need some money? I would say, I have told God what I need. If you want to give it to us, ask God. He will tell you what to do. And so I did not share this, but only that I wished to open an orphanage. A little boy was 12 years of age. He was dying of consumption. And all the money in the world he had was one shilling. And he said to his parents as he was dying, give this to Brother Mueller for the orphans. And so they gave it to me. They said, this is for orphans. Perhaps I had only one shilling was of faith. Yeah. But we began to pray and God opened wide the windows of heaven and poured out His blessing upon us. We prayed for a house. God gave us a house. We prayed for a couple to be the parents for the orphans. God provided a couple. We prayed for everything, pots, pans, knives, forks, spoons, cups, saucers, plates, tables, chairs, beds, blankets, everything, everything, even treacle, because God knows that uh, children like sweet things. Treacle, it is... Uh, Sort of, uh, it is like your molasses, very sweet. And so all of this was ready. It was uh, wonderful. God had poured out all this. We had everything. Everything was in readiness. Everything was uh, just exactly in place. We had everything, but we had no orphans. We had forgot to ask God for orphans. The scripture, it is very clear. It says you have not because you ask not. Yeah? And so we gathered together and we prayed, Father, please send us orphans. I thought we should start out with little girl orphans. I thought little girl orphans, they would be so much easier than little boy orphans. That was before my own daughter was born. I did not know so much back then. God gave us 30 little girls from age 2 to age 12. But it was not enough. So God gave us a second house and He filled that house with 30 babies from just a few hours old to age two. But that was also not enough. And God gave us a third house, and He filled our house with 30 boys, 90 children. I'm going to tell you some stories. Some of you will say, oh, I know that story. I like that story. It is a good story. I like to hear that story. Yeah. First, it is not a story. It is true. Secondly, it did not one time only happen. It was not unusual in the first 10 years of the ministry for us to get up in the morning and there would be no money, no food, nothing. And when I say nothing, I mean nothing. One time, uh, my wife and I, we took our wedding bands, we pawned them to, to, to purchase food for the children. And so there we were. We arose in the morning, no food, no money. The table was set, the children were there. I would go in, pray for them in the morning. For the... You have said, take no thought, saying, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, or for us all shall ye be clothed, and for us, we have nothing to eat and nothing to drink, and we are thinking about such things this morning. I come boldly. Scripture says to come boldly. I come boldly. Even as I pray, knock at the door. Young lady should go to the door. There is a man standing outside. He said, I own a dairy, and my milk wagon, the axle, has broken down right outside of your door. I cannot deliver the milk. It will all spoil. Do you need some milk? We got every pot and pan and jack and jar to fill with all of this milk to take to the three orphan houses. 
And so now the table is set. There is cup of milk. Father, thank you for the milk, but we cannot live on milk also. We must have something to eat. I come boldly. The scripture says, open wide your mouth and he will fill it. It's good to have a big mouth for God to fill. Yeah. Like the bird. Again, even as I pray, knock at the door, young lady should go. Husband and wife, they are standing outside the door. They say, we own a bakery and we have woke right away at 3 o'clock this morning that we should bake bread for the orphans. Do you need some bread? Our God is such a good God. He gives to His children not only bread, our God gives fresh bread to His children. Yeah. And so God met the need. But then I received a letter from Mr. Anonymous. Do you have a letter from him? It said, your orphanages are making my property value go down. Move them. Nice letter, yeah? He did not send any money to help us move. There was not a map to show us where to move. But I knew that there was a piece of property for sale and actually down, seven acres. I knew that the man who owned the property was asking 200 pounds an acre, and I knew that we did not have so much money. We had only enough to pay 120 pounds an acre for this property. And so I thought, I'm going to help God out. Have you ever thought this? Yeah? Going to help God out? Helping God out is like when my daughter was little, she would come into my study. Papa, I'm going to help you out. Oh, thank you. You are a wonderful daughter. Thank you for helping. Oh, what a wonderful job you do. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. And I would have to undo all that she had done. Yeah. It is like this, I think, when we try to help God out. So I go to this man's house. He is not there. He's at his place of business. They say, I go there. He is not there neither. And so I go home. I say, God, I'm going to stop trying to help you out. I go to bed. I sleep like the baby. I arise early in the morning, 5 o'clock, 5.30. 5.30 in the morning, this man, he comes to see me. Brother Mueller, I understand you wish to have uh, this property. I have been awake all night, pacing back and forth. I do not know what to do. I wish that I could just give it to you, but I cannot. I have a debt that I must pay. That is why I am selling the property. I was selling it for 200 pounds an acre to pay the debt and, and uh, make a profit. But if you could have, oh, I do not wish so much to ask, could you pay 120 pounds an acre for this property? You see, God had given this man the property to meet our need, and God had given us the money to meet his need. Yeah. Sometimes we think only of ourselves, but this is a sovereign God. All of this is in his understanding. And then another man come, I will design a building for you. Another man come, I will give you the stone for the building. Another man come, I will give you the glass for the windows. Another man come, I will give you the slate for the roof. And God built a house for 350 orphans. But it was not enough. And God built a second house and provided for all of that and enlarged the first house. 1,000 orphans. But it was not enough. And God built a third house. 1,500 orphans. God gave us 11 acres of property adjacent to the first seven, built a fourth house, 2,000 orphans. A fifth house, 2,500 orphans. And every day, God feeds them. And God puts shoes on their feet and clothes on their backs. If you can imagine everyone at your church being fed this way every day, 3,500 orphans. Yeah. It's good to be God's orphan. Yeah. The child of God. Adopted by Him. And God met the need. Do you have a need that is greater than this? There are so many stories I would like to share with you. But time does not permit us this morning. But I will share some. It was in the midst of the English winter. English winters are cold and wet and miserable. The weather comes from Russia across the Urals. It comes through the Scandinavian countries. And by the time the wind reaches England, it is cold. It is terrible. 
And one of the boilers in one of the orphan houses had developed a crack. And the men who come, they say, we're going to have to put out the fire. You cannot have the, the fire and the boiler any longer. It's going to take us two weeks to repair this. And I say, Fora, this is too long. The children, they will get sick. They will get cold. They will die of consumption. They will die of pneumonia. Father, something you must do. And so I prayed, Father, give the men a mind to work. And so the next day, the men they, who have the boiler, they come back to me. They say, Brother Mueller, we have talked among ourselves. We are not going to take two weeks. We will work around the clock, not stopping. We think perhaps three days, not two weeks. Thank you so much. Father, still three days, the children, they will get cold. You must do something. And so the day came, and we put out the fire in the boiler. And that day, when the boiler was out, God turned the weather around. Not from the cold Northland, but God, He brought the weather from the Mediterranean Sea. Warm weather. It was like the breath of springtime in the midst of wintertime. Oh, what an accident, you say. No. God is all powerful. Jesus Christ stood in the boat there with his disciples in the midst of the storm and he said, peace, be still. And in the very same way, God looked down and he saw the wind and he said, I will turn this around and I will keep the children warm with my very breath. Yeah. The boiling was complete was warm again inside God lift his hand the wind turned around another time it was pouring rain into the roof uh, there was a leak and we could not do nothing it was a uh, uh, storm and the children they were getting wet and there was no way to stop the leak and I pray again Father please I do not know what to do it is raining either you must stop the rain or change something and again God turned the wind around and it blew to the other side not leaking yeah what an accident, you say. No, this is the power of God. I will tell you one more story, and then I will be silent. We had a need for 20,000 English pounds. That is in your money uh, here now today, approximately $1 million. I did not have $1 million worth of faith, and I certainly did not have $1 million. We have a policy, as I say, if you give money for something, it goes only for this, for food, for clothing, for whatever, and uh, God uh, had not provided for this. A lady who was a seamstress, she came to me, she said, I want to give you 100 English pounds. A lady for whom I sold passed away, and she left me this legacy for my retirement, but I wish for you to have it. God told me to give this to you for this project. And I said to her, I cannot take your money. And she is pushing it at me, and I'm pushing it back. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And then she said something. It was as if she had slapped me across the face. She said, if you do not take this money, you will rob me of the blessing of giving it to God. I was ashamed. I said, I will take this money, but if ever again you need it, I will give it back to you. And that has been many years now. God has met her need. And so to her, I say, thank you for your gift to God. I say, this is not 20,000 pounds. Is this not how we are? God begins to meet the need, and we say, why have you not already met the need? There is an expression, Gott sei, ist richtig sein. God's time is the right time. A few days passed, we received 1,000 pound gift. Never before, 30 years of the ministry, have we had such a gift. Thank you. For the steel, this is not 20,000 pounds. A few days passed more, 2,000 pound gift. Thank you. For the steel, this is not 20,000 pounds. A few days passed more, 3,000 pound gift. Largest gift ever in the time of our ministry. Thank you. For the steel, this is not 20,000 pounds. People write to me about many things to pray, and I receive many letters. I received a letter from a young man. He was from a very wealthy family, and he said to me, God has called me to the mission field of India, and I believe I should just go. But my parents do not wish for me to go. My parents said to me, if you will stay and run the family business, much money, we will send 10 missionaries in your place. That sounds very good, yeah? But you see, he said to me, God did not call me to send 10 missionaries. Called me, God called me to go as a missionary. The scripture tells us obedience is better than sacrifice. But sacrifice, it makes us feel good, yeah? 
when we should just obey. I should just go, he said. I wrote back to him. Young man, the scripture also says, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the earth. And so you may go, but you will not be there very long. Let us pray that God will change their hearts. This young man did not have enough faith to believe that God would change the hearts of parents. Yeah, that takes a lot of faith. And so we began to pray. One month passed, I received from him a letter. In his letter, he put a gold watch. He said, you are right. My parents have changed their hearts. God has changed it. I'm going to India. Take this gold watch, sell it to buy food for the children. In India, I will be on God's time, and I will not need to know. And so this we did. But also in his letter, he said to us, would you pray that my sister would come and join me? She is much caught up in the things of the world, a very vain young lady. Please pray that she would come. And so we began to pray for her. Another month passed. I received a letter from this young lady and a, a box. In her letter, she said, I understand you have been praying for me. And I wish for you to know that I'm going with my brother to the mission field of India. God has changed my heart. I'm giving you the toys of my vanity from one who no longer has need for such things. And I'm saying to myself, toys? What does she mean, toys? I am Prussian. You say toys. It is toys. And I am thinking to myself, this box, it cannot hold enough toys for all of the orphans. And if you give one child a toy, all the children must have the toy. You cannot give to one child, not to all the children. What is she thinking? And so I, I pull aside this string and I take the brown paper off the package and there is a box, a wooden box. And I open up the box. And I think it is the crown jewels of England. Here is a sapphire necklace. Stones the size of a robin's egg set in gold. Sapphire earrings and a sapphire brooch, deep blue stones. And I take them out, I set them aside. I, I sent for one of the young men. I said, God, there is a jeweler. I do not know the value of this. And as I am feeling there is more, and I pull aside the cotton, the cotton wool, and there is a diamond necklace, diamond earrings, and a diamond ring. And the jeweler comes and he looks at these things and he says, this is nearly three quarters of a million dollars in jewels. And I thought to myself, so long ago on the bowels of the earth, the hand of God, he made those stones for this very day. And he hid them. He hid them in the vault of heaven. And God guided the man who discovered his stones and take them out of the ground. And God, he guided the hand of the man who cut these stones and the man who set these stones. And even this young lady in her vanity, she chose these stones for this day because God's time is the right time. Because God is faithful. Because we can believe that he is. And the jeweler was taking these stones to sell. I said, just for a moment, for this, there must be a record. And I took the diamond ring. I put it here upon my finger. I went to the glass where I would look out and pray for the children as they would be at play. And I cut in the glass the name of God. I cut Yahweh Yireh. The Lord will provide. Because for us, even the very name of God, it is a promise that He shall do what He has said. I do not know today what you are going through. I do not know the trouble that is in your life. I do not know the attacks that have come to you. But I know this, that God is faithful. That we can believe that He is 
today, I do not wish for you to say, oh, I'm going to pray more. I, I'm going to pray for five minutes every day or 15 minutes every day or an hour every day. No, what I want most for you today is for you to take the promises of God and hold them to your heart. <sighs> to believe that He is. That He is a reward of them that diligently seek Him. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Let us believe that He is, yeah? that He is, and hold to the promises of God.